The Unshackled Waves, episode 82. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. We've got another In Focus show for you coming up in a moment. But first, if you're a regular viewer of the video version of the show, you would have noticed some changes over the past few episodes. We've gradually updated our graphics uh, to give the show a bit more of a professional look. Now our listeners will have noticed at the beginning of this show we had an intro voiceover, mainly so I don't have to repeat uh, every introduction at the beginning of the show, and there will also be an uh, outro voiceover as well. So I hope that these uh, improve your viewing and listening experience. We're always looking at ways to improve the show and take it to the next level. So now on with the show. For those of you who don't know, I'll be in New Zealand for the two weeks in the lead up to uh, their general election on September 23rd. Uh, While I'm over in New Zealand, I'll be speaking with a number of candidates and activists. Uh, But the election campaign is already in full swing over there. Uh, So before I uh, set off to New Zealand, I thought I'd get a summary of events so far. And who better than our friend from Right Minds New Zealand, Due Duboa. Welcome again, Due. Hello, Tim. Thanks for having me on the show again. Yes, you're our first returning guest, so I hope that you take that as a compliment. (laughs) Thank you. Now, uh, we'll we'll, we'll get the lowdown about, you know, where we're at at this campaign. So who would you say is winning winning at this stage? I mean, what do the polls say? So according to the polls, um, basically everyone except for Labour is uh, losing. So Labour are sort of the only winners at the moment according to the polls. the uh, National Party, since the departure of John Key, has dropped from about 50% to about as low as 40 um, probably say they're sitting a little bit higher than that, maybe, uh, but not higher than 45 probably. Um, but it's, it's likely at this point they're heading for the, uh, the low 40s. Um, and the Labour Party, from its low point with uh, Andrew Little, has gone from about 24%, uh, now in the latest poll to 43%. So they are actually sitting about one, uh, possibly, according to the latest poll anyway, they're sitting one point ahead of uh, National now. Um, uh, the Green Party uh, might be uh, wiped out, uh, maybe. They're sitting at about 4 or 5%, and we have a uh, 5% threshold when it comes to the um, party vote. So I'd say it's probably likely they um, they could still get 5%, um, but they're big losers there, possibly. Um, and New Zealand First has been fairly steady, um, a um, little bit lower recently, but between about uh, 8% and 12% of the vote, uh, depending on the poll. Um, but yes, basically, according to the polls, uh, Labour is really winning, really hitting it home. Um, and that's, yeah, that's it, really. But what about the performance of the, the leaders? I mean, obviously, the, this is where they're, they're scrutinised uh, the most. I mean, has there been any sort of major uh, gaffes or, or stuff-ups, or have... No, has it been? Uh, um, no, so I mean, the the leaders have all have all been doing um, pretty well. I think I'm I'm trying to think of negative press some of them have gotten. I think uh, Jacinda's been keeping very positive press. Um, Bill English has been keeping it um, steady. Um, I, Bill English is not the kind of guy to get so much positive press, but he's not been getting uh, not been getting negative, uh, and he's definitely not been um, been making any gaffes. Um, both the uh, deputy uh, leaders of, of National and Labour have have, um, have have said some silly things or insulted people, um, same as the uh, ACT Party leader. Um, and uh, yeah, when it comes to say the Greens, their leader um, they've had a leader resign because of a, a fraud investigation. Um, their new leader was defending the old leader. Um, nobody there has apologised. Um, um, some of the other minor party leaders, uh, we've got Gareth Morgan, who started up his own party. Um, he likes to say inflammatory things. Um, I think it's hard to tell whether they uh, uh, count as, as gaffes or not, because everything he says might be considered a gaffe, so it's a bit hard to tell. Um, yeah, But the, the main two party leaders really have been 
um, performing well overall, I would say, and, and when it comes to at least uh, not making any obvious mistakes. Now, a lot of the uh, discussion in the, the media, both in New Zealand and uh, I'm getting a lot of it over here in Australia as well, has been about the, the personalities, uh, Bill English, uh, uh, Jacinta Ardern, obviously the two major ones, uh, Winston Peters has also made an appearance on uh, Australian television, but what are the actual issues that are of concern to voters? I mean, you know, what, what, are, what are people concerned about this election? Um, well, interestingly enough, as far as I could, uh, as far as I can tell, it seems like very likely it, uh, the election might really be about personalities because um, the both major parties have changed leaders, but they haven't really made any big policy changes um, other than the Labour Party announcing a lot of new taxes, um, which you think might normally not go down as well. But um, um, so, so they haven't made big policy changes, but they have, have made big shifts in the polls. Um, but what, what, what might be influencing that with regards to issues that people care about would be housing uh, is really the number one issue um, uh, that people find, find important, at least consistently that comes up as number one. House prices here are going through the roof, um, not enough houses being built in Auckland. Uh, immigration is tied into that really. Um, a lot of people are not happy with the uh, high immigration that we have. Um, just 70, I think comes up, up to as high as 70,000 as numbers that I've heard. Um, 70,000 net immigration, which for a small country of uh, about 5 million is a lot of people coming in every year. Um, and most of those go to Auckland, and so the prices keep going up. Um, uh, uh, foreign investment and things like that. Um, um, uh, tenancy, a lot, of, a lot of, of these new houses and existing houses are becoming rentals. A lot of people are renting uh, more now than ever. Um, and so a lot of a lot of that that these housing and issues relating to housing are really important, and this is where I think National is getting hit hard on the policy side because they've been running it for the last nine years, and when you've been running it for the last nine years, people aren't going to believe you if you're going to tell them that you're going to fix it in the next three years, um, and that's that's the number one issue I think where they're getting hit. A um, few other things coming around with uh, regards to wages, uh, minimum wage, you know, the increase in in wages. Um, obviously, uh, Jacinda and Labour have um, try, you know, trying to pull in the uh, the gender wage gap into things a little bit, but um, um, uh, according to the stats, anyway, there uh, isn't much of a uh, a pay difference between an absolute pay difference between between men and women across the board, uh, you know, across all professions. So we're not talking same pay for same work. We're just talking completely generally. Um, I think a nine 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 percent difference or something. Um, not taking any professions and, and, and things like that into account. So, um, but yeah, whether that would be counted as a big issue, I'm not sure. Labor is trying, not sure if it's working. I think it basically all comes back to housing and anything that's related to housing. Uh, that's the impression I got from watching the debate that housing was the was the big issue, and from what you've described, it is really you know affecting you know people you know on, on the ground. I mean, you talked about a lot of people are renting. Is it is it affecting other parts of New Zealand as well? Um, we, I think overall um, prices are either increasing, in some of the more regions they're more stagnant, there are areas where people are just not interested in moving to, and that's where the house prices are even, I think, decreasing. There are some parts where they're decreasing, um, but as long as there's an inflow of people into areas, you will see, um, you will see housing being a big issue. Obviously, down in Christchurch, with the earthquakes of recent years, they've still got a lot of infrastructure problems down there, um, and 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 that's really drawn a lot of the uh, housing, a lot of the building engineering markets gone down to Christchurch to help with with rebuilding things, um, and and so there's a, there's a, a sort of a conflict and a, a tug of war there between trying to rebuild uh, Christchurch very slowly and then trying to expand Auckland, which needs to be expanding quickly, but isn't expanding, uh, uh, you know, it's not, not, the houses are not expanding fast enough. And, uh, yeah. So as, uh, when it comes to, to the smaller towns and, um, smaller cities, there's definitely, uh, not a problem there at all. And they some of them even have, have, um, have declining housing markets there because people are leaving because there's, uh, no, no jobs there. Uh, what do you think is the the main thing that will fix it? Because we've got the same 
uh, problem here in Australia. It's talked about all the time. You know, we need to fix housing affordability. Yet no one proposes, you know, a you know cut through solution. Yeah. Um, we've actually had some some good solutions from suggested from Labor. Even I think one thing that would really help Auckland is um, we've got a um, something called the Metropolitan Urban Limit. It's basically an imaginary line that's drawn around the city. And if you live on the one side of the line, you can build a house, and if you live on the other side of the line, you can't build a house. Um, and that gets extended very, very slowly. So Auckland grows um, a lot faster than they extend the line out. And um, people do land banking, so the land becomes worth more and more and more when there's anticipation that, hey, the boundary is going to grow. Um, so I think both Labour and the um, the ACT Party, the sort of considered the more libertarian party, they both proposed dropping that. National uh, hasn't. Um, uh, again, the ACT, the Libertarian Party solution is uh, is to open up uh, all the land, all of it, all the Crown land, uh, anything around Auckland, open all of it up for building. Uh, basically, at the same time, anybody can start building more houses. Um, nobody else wants to support that, so not going to happen. Um, uh, New Zealand First is really saying we're just going to cut immigration from you know seventy thousand down to twenty thousand, net immigration down, um, and um, that probably would be a fix. Um, if you've got no people coming in anymore, you don't need any more houses. Problem solved. Um, yeah, and I think Labour wants to uh, decrease immigration a little bit too there. So, in, in my opinion, actually, when it comes to to those large parties in in, in Parliament, probably Labour actually does have the best. Uh, housing fix, although um, um, they want to bring in more taxes to do it as well, uh, capital gains taxes, and uh, and on it goes. So, um, will they be able to do it? We'll we'll find out because at this point it, it does look like uh, we'll be having a Labour government if things continue at the current trend. Yeah, uh, that actually does sound that Labour's got the uh, best solution because to me it's you know simple just de uh, deregulate the housing market you know re release more more land it's just that you know political parties never seem to propose it exactly yeah um i mean whether they'll actually do it is another is another question because we have a labor party um mayor of auckland auckland city council could do it and they won't do it um release more land um but in my opinion, that's that's got to be it. But we'll see if, if anybody gets there. Um, and I think nat yeah, national, I I'm, I don't think anybody really knows what their plan is to fix it again because they've been running it for nine years and they've been saying for nine years basically, oh, there's no housing crisis. There's no housing crisis. Um, so, um, I, and I think they finally admitted there is a housing crisis and now you're in trouble because you've been saying that there isn't one and everyone else has been saying there is one and now you say. Uh, yeah, maybe there is a housing crisis, um, you know, but you you still don't really have a, a plan that people are happy with because you would have implemented it by now is, is what they think. Now, obviously, the the big game changer in this campaign has been uh, Jacinta Ardern becoming Labour leader of, uh, only a month ago. I mean, before her, uh, Andrew Little was the leader. He was tapped on the shoulder and told to resign because Labor's vote was at an historic low, 23%. National looked like they were uh, cruising to you know their fourth landslide victory. But she's like, looks like she's going to pull off one of the greatest political miracles, I'd say, in world history. I mean, it's incredible that she's been able to, you know, turn it around. I mean, what is it about? Uh, Jacinta, I mean, the media of uh, media over here have called it uh, Jacinta mania. Uh, I prefer to call it Jacinta madness. But you know, why has she you know <laughs> been able to have this miraculous turnaround for Labor? Um, I think um, you know personality. She's got um, a personality, and this is why um, uh, John Key. She's basically Labor's version of John Key. Um, John Key had. Labour on the run for nine years. He would have had them run on the run for three more years if he had wanted it. Um, and he had a personality uh, that people just really liked. And he looked good. He acted good. And uh, and people just loved it. Um, and so that's that's really what she's got there. Um, got got going for her. People people think she looks good. They really like um, um, like the way that she interacts with people and. and um, and and the way that she the way that she talks and, and on it goes um, just 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 the way that John Key did it and Bill English is just like all the previous Labour leaders were 
he's boring and he's just some old guy and, and he doesn't look as good as, as John Key and he doesn't look as good as Jacinda. Um, and that's what all four or five of the past Labour leaders basically had against, uh, against John Key um, was that they could not compete with him in that personality department. Um, and that's been, I think, the really big win for Labour is having, having that personality um, uh, that people really like and, and people are really attracted to. Uh, it begs the question: Why wasn't she made Labour leader sooner? I mean, why why has why did they wait until pretty much the the last minute where they actually had to you know tear down some you know billboards to to put her face up in time? I mean, it, it seems yeah. like it seems now like what, what was the Labour Party waiting for? I mean, this was your star candidate. Um, there was a poll that came out, um, and they 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 thought, ah, uh, you know, we'll hang on. Um, um, they switched leaders a few times. I think there was probably um, a lot of question about um, Jacinda's experience. Um, you know, being being so young, um, only having been a sort of a backbench, uh, not even a backbench MP, but an opposition uh, MP, not really having any legislation or experience in government. Um, um, and I think they were a bit worried about you know putting her up on the front on the on uh, right as up the front as leader, which is why they actually pushed their uh, deputy leader aside and made her deputy leader for a little bit, in the in the hopes to boost uh, boost their image. But yeah, when that um, that poll came out that put Labour at twenty three percent with her as the more preferred leader, uh, you know, more uh, more preferred uh, prime minister, because we have the you know preferred prime minister ranking, and she she was at something like ten percent or maybe even over ten percent. She was second or third. I think she was third place just after Winston Peters as preferred. Uh, MP, uh, no, sorry, PM, and uh, and Andrew Little was in fourth place, distant fourth place, and I think that when that poll came out, um, they had no choice but to kick him aside and, and put her in charge. So, so you do think now that Labour will win? Um, I'm, I'm not actually, I'm not actually sure. Um, a lot, basically, for the last, even the last year or so, I think almost. The, the polls have basically been saying, ah, oh, um, New Zealand first holds the balance of power. I think that's been the, the footnote on every single poll for at least several months, and if not over a year. Um, it may have even been before the last election, but it just didn't happen because, you know, just enough people voted for for, um, for, for uh, National, and people thought, oh, well, if National's polling at 45, 48, you know, 47, 48%, you know, maybe as high as 50%, you know, it'll be okay. They'll pull it over on election day. Um, but now that they're polling a bit lower, it seems like they will need somebody else. And um, Labour's polling higher, basically on par at the moment, and so they'll need someone else too. Um, and when it comes to, to New Zealand first holding the balance of power, which side are they going to go with? That's that's going to be the interesting question on who is going to win, um, who can offer the better deal, and um, yeah. Um, uh, I think at, at this point, uh, because there are more left-wing parties than right-wing parties, because we have, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of centre-right party, uh, although I might sometimes dispute that, in the National Party, and then we have, you know, the Libertarian Act Party, and, and that's it. And then you've got seven or eight, uh, um, I, th I think, as many as, at least that are seven or eight that are, are running on the left, and probably a good four or five that would, might make it in at the end of the day. Um, you've got a whole lot more possibilities over there for adding up the numbers. Uh, I, I've noticed uh, with uh, Jacinta, uh, maybe it's just uh, in, in Australia that she seems to have awoken the the feminist sisterhood. I mean, there was a huge international outrage that you know she was asked about her um, plans to uh, st start a family, which actually she herself said. Uh, a few months ago, she wasn't interested in being leader because she wanted to um, have children. So that really uh, energised the, you know, sisterhood. I, you know, this is our new icon. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I wrote an article at Right Minds about that at the time, and all the um, all the feminists came out to uh, to defend her as well. And uh, uh, um, I think I think in that sense, they have have really energised that. Side, um, you know, again, it's it's it's, uh, it's a woman running, and and you know, women power, or, or you know, might 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 give you a few extra points uh, uh, to boost you, 
suddenly you go from sort of negative media coverage to a lot of positive media coverage because they, you know, the media really loves her. Um, you know, it's going to be worth a few extra points. Um, implosion of the Green Party. Oh well, why would we vote for you know the, um, um, you know, sort of the the women feminist Green Party when hey we can just vote for Jacinda because she's a woman too and she's a feminist as well. Um, so so solidifying the left wing feminist vote behind her has helped. Um, and I know someone who thought that oh well the working class vote might abandon her and but it hasn't. They they don't seem to care. So um, that definitely. Uh, as a feminist icon, she's um, she's pulling in pulling in a lot of support there. Uh, I've made the point in in several articles I've done on New Zealand politics recently. If there's a you know patriarchy in the world, it's obviously not ver working very well when you know this you know 37 year old woman can come out of nowhere and look set to be like the next New Zealand prime minister. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, there's still yeah, I, I'm not sure what the uh, or you know what what your average person thinks about the patriarchy, but at least it's well in sort of you know well ingrained I think in the general population that you know women are are a bit hard done by and have been a bit hard done by even if that's not the case. Um, it it does seem to be worth it does seem to be worth something when it really comes to politics. Uh, at least that's what we're seeing. Uh, but New Zealand's already had you know, two female prime ministers. I mean, there was Jenny Shipley for a brief time in the '90s, and obviously Helen Clark won, you know, three elections. So uh, I don't have uh, in Australia. We've only had you know one uh, female prime minister for three years, and apparently, like mm. she was run out of the job because of you know, m misogyny. But I, I wouldn't have thought, like, given New Zealand's track record, that you know the feminists, like their their grievances, would you know have as much weight over there. I think when it comes to, I think the internet might play a big part in this. When it comes to the rest of the world, um, the global grievances really affect what happens um, and really shapes people's perceptions. Um, the media, obviously, a lot of our media are foreign owned, um, um, you know, feeding in that extra interest. Uh, the media being connected around the world, they're pushing the same agenda as, as in every other country. So, um, yeah, New Zealand doesn't have that problem, and, and it, I mean, maybe that's another thing. No, no one, no one is going to think twice about voting for a woman. Um, so you're not going to lose anything there. So because they're basically, you know, there is no patriarchy, but you still do have the feminist movement who give you that extra boost. So you got you, you lose nothing and you gain something. Um, whereas uh, maybe in in other places you might lose something and gain something. Do you, do you think that, uh, this is something I wonder, that Bill English, he's afraid to go in hard against Jacinta Ardern because he don't want to be seen as, you know, attacking a woman? Yeah, so um, um, it could be, but he's also, he's Bill English, he lost, he lost an election before. I think he got a Nationals' worst result ever or second worst result ever um, against... Alan Clark. Alan Clark, I think. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah, you're so the, you're the he's lost against Alan Clark before. <laughs> um, and yeah, I it's it's I I'm I'm not sure if he's if he's pulling his punches or if it wouldn't make a difference. He's he's it seems like he's just not the man made to be Prime Minister. Uh, he's not, not destined to win an election in that sense because um, he just doesn't have um, he doesn't have the aggressiveness, maybe. I think he's very, um, he is a very sort of passive, passive person. Well, um, so I think that's, again, coming back to personalities, his personality. So I don't think he's, he's too worried. I think it's, it is more his personality. Um, but when it comes to that, um, um, another uh, party leader, I've mentioned Gareth Morgan before, uh, from the Opportunities Party, um, his own one. He called, you know, he says, oh, you know, just send will have to prove that she's more than just lipstick on a pig. And that you know that created big uproar, and and, and same as with your you know um, being asked if she was uh, going to have kids uh, before the debate. Um, Mike Hosking asked her what she was going to wear to the debate. Um, so so they you know there's um, and and there is always uproar and backlash there. So I think Bill English doesn't want to have any of those things happen to him. Um, but I think most of the other people who have done it have done it on purpose to get get a bit of attention there. 
um, and and to really tie in the lipstick on a pig comment uh, to both Bill English and and Jacinda Ardern is uh, um, um, basically I would say John Key was the lipstick on the pig, um, and and Bill English is just the pig without the lipstick. Um, whereas on the Labour side you had uh, um, uh, Andrew Little who was uh, you know the pig without the lipstick, and now that you've got Jacinda Ardern you've suddenly got lipstick on the pig again. So. National National now looks bad because of the leader, and Labour now looks good because of the leader. I think that's really, really making the difference. Uh, people forget that that expression "lipstick on a pig" it, it 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 it's not actually a gendered term, like just because it like refers to no. lipstick. No. But but it, it's you know the uh, they got outraged with you know Gareth Morgan using it but it was actually an Obama line he, he used it to describe uh, Sarah Palin back in you know 2008 yet uh, Obama was you know, able to be the the feminist icon <laughs> exactly yeah um, that's why I said like I think Gareth Morgan uh, did that on purpose to get get some attention I don't think it really worked well enough for him um, but yeah the the whole, the whole way that he used it was he was calling uh, the you know Labour Party the pig you know basically you know the Labour Party is is ugly and she's just making it look good and same same with uh, with National there but except Bill English isn't making it look good. <laughs> uh, well, what is it? Because like I only know like you know John Key and Bill English you know s superficially like uh, you know Bill English presents you know all right like what is so. You know, I guess unlikable or boring about him that 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 puts so many people off him. Um, I it's hard. I, I at least I find it hard to describe. All I can say is I can look at him and I think, no, he doesn't. You know, and you can I can hear him talk and I can listen to him for you know twenty thirty seconds and I I don't feel. I don't, you know, I don't feel especially engaged by what he's saying, I, and and I think that's that's probably the way that most people are feeling. Um, yeah, sort of, you know, cult of personality stuff. You know, some people have got that charisma, and he just he just doesn't have the um, the extra charisma that you need in that kind of position, and uh, that's that's really costing uh, costing them dearly, I think. Now, another major event of uh, this election has been the, the downfall of the New Zealand Greens. Uh, obviously, the, the big scandal was their, their co-leader, because uh, New Zealand Greens, they have a male and uh, female co-leader for you know, gender equality purposes. Uh, their female co-leader, um, I hope I can pronounce her name right, uh, Metura uh, Turi, she uh, confessed uh, that she committed welfare fraud back in the, the 1990s. Was it, was it this scandal alone that led to the collapse of their vote so much that they might not even get any representation, or is there other factors as well? Um, so that, I think, was the biggest factor, and the other factor coming back to um, the, the number one topic uh, of, of all our conversations, Jacinda Ardern. Um, she, she really started to pull away green support, I think, and um, the... Um, yeah, Toure's um, um, admission, because she went out and admitted it uh, to welfare fraud and then to electoral fraud, um, really drove a lot of people away from them. But uh, enough people were staying with them. You know, the poll, polling results came out initially. I think they, they, they bounced back up after she admitted to welfare fraud. In the next poll, they were up a little. Um, but then it dragged on and dragged on. The, um, you know, the electoral fraud came in after that. And then the pressure was on. Uh, two two of their MPs resigned, um, and she thought, ah, oh, you know, I, I, you know, she quit. And then all the people who had stuck with her were now really angry at the Greens because, oh, she's gone. They threw her under the bus, and so um, they annoyed all the people who didn't like it, and 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 then they annoyed all the people who stayed loyal to them. Um, so when uh, and then of course, you know, the third the third part of that, of course, still, you know. Labour trying to draw away their votes, so that really helped as well. Um, and so, so those three things combined: the fact that she committed the fraud, <laughs> and then you know didn't apologise for it, and then the fact that she resigned over it. Um, those, those are the really the two, the double-edged sword that really led to the downfall of the Greens, I think. 
And the reason that she confessed to it because she thought that it would help her politically, like because she was trying to make a point, wasn't she, that it's so hard to be on welfare that you know I had to you know lie on the form, uh, but she you know quite misjudged the situation. Yeah, so there are a couple of, of theories there. Um, one thing is that uh, two top green staffers were, um, uh, how do you put it, um, reassigned um, in uh, a couple of weeks after that happened, or maybe even just a week after it happened, actually. Um, and, and they were probably quite heavily involved in, in suggesting this and marketing it, because uh, when your top two campaign staffers are moved on uh, three weeks, before, four weeks before the election, you sort of know that they must have screwed up. Um, and then the other theory was that um, she thought that you know Winston Peters might have hold of this information, and um, or at least somebody else had hold of this information, and so she decided to come public uh, with it before somebody else did, and so that you know maybe she'd look a bit better if she came public about it and she announced it, um, then you know pe people wouldn't be as upset as if somebody else had outed her. Um, but it could really just be that. You know, they believed it really would work, and they that that might have been it. You know, they are the Greens. They are, um, you know, that they're really just, um, uh, you know, watermelons as we call them, green on the outside and red on the inside. And I think they really thought that, that hardcore welfare socialism um, uh, sort of pity would get them somewhere. And uh, indeed, like I said, in the very next poll, it did get them somewhere. Um, they did get, you know, they did actually go up in the next poll. Whether that would have held, we don't know. But um, just the political pressure was too much, and, and that broke her down. Um, I think there was one more thing. Her family, her family came into it. Actually, that's why she, I think, she stepped down eventually, and why everything fell apart. Because she said, oh, "I had to do it because my family wouldn't help me." Um, and then, of course, her family came out and said, "Hey, hey, hey! Um, uh, you know, we did actually help you out, and um, you know, we or or she didn't ask for that much help or whatever it was, but they basically." Um, um, uh, said, uh, you know, hey, this is not true that we didn't help her. And um, um, when your family starts uh, denouncing you on on, uh, on public television, or at least is about to do it, um, that that's really going to have a big effect on uh, on your political future, I think. Uh, for, for people like us who uh, don't like the Greens, I mean, it, it would have been, you know, very satisfying to see them, you know, completely uh, botch, you know, the handling of this, well, you know, uh, not just the confession, but just the aftermath as well to cause maximum political damage. And and I think they did. They handled it the worst way they possibly could, and we were quite happy to see that. Uh, many people were, were not, well, basically, if you're not the Greens, you probably don't like the Greens. I think that's the way it goes. Um, but I actually almost I'm hoping they make it back in because if there is going to be a left-wing coalition they will really want to be part of it and they probably will have to be part of it and um, you know it's going to be um, um, harder for a left-wing coalition to be formed the more you know fragmented parties have to be part of it um, but then again you know is having you know if we do have a left-wing government having the Greens being part of that could also be a really 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 negative thing um, so there's a there's there's a possible upside, uh, a possible downside to, to having them out. Um, but I, overall, I think um, most uh, right-wing people would be more than happy to see the Greens gone completely. And if they keep polling at 5% at on election day, um, it's more than likely they'll get below that because the Greens normally, um, normally come out a percentage point or two lower than the polls. So and it's, that you, can, you can keep up hope. <laughs> I find that a lot of people that they're saying they wouldn't, uh, uh, they would be able to live with a Labour New Zealand First Coalition, but if it was a Labour Greens one, they, they would consider that a disaster for the nation. Uh, yeah, so um, it would possibly be, uh, with the current sort of, the way the polls are trending, it would be possible to have a um, Labour Green Maori Coalition. Um, and that would probably be an absolute disaster that nobody would want. Um, people are more happy maybe with the Labour New Zealand First Coalition because both of them are um, anti-immigration uh, parties essentially, or at least have some anti uh, And I say anti-immigration in that they want to reduce it from 70 to, you know, 60, 50, 40 or whatever. Um, uh, 40,000 net immigration per year. So um, a lot of the, the right-wing crowd 
that's upset that they don't have any uh, any uh, anti-immigration options to vote for um, would probably say, oh, maybe it's worth it. You know, maybe it wouldn't be too bad if New Zealand First can, you know, pull to the right a little bit. Um, but there's some dispute about whether New Zealand First is more right wing or more left wing, um, which might be why they are the only sort of true centrist party in New Zealand, or at least considered the true centrist party, not that they are truly centrist, but simply because um, nobody can agree whether they're left wing or right wing. Yeah, so as you said at the, the beginning of the show, I mean, New Zealand First, which you know is pretty much a cult of personality around their leader, Winston Peters, who's, well, he's in his 70s now. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's really you know, yeah. had a political comeback himself. I mean, his party lost representation, I think, in uh, 2008. And it's interesting that he, it, it's deemed acceptable that he could govern with either political party because he has been in a coalition with National uh, and Labor, or what do sort of New Zealand first, you know, voters and supporters, do they, uh, are they happy for, you know, Winston to try and get the, the best deal from either party? Because I know that with, you know, cons- uh, uh, you know, <coughs> conservative minor parties, it's considered, you know, scandalous if they, you know, uh, try and team up with uh, the Labor Party. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, overall, from polls that have been done of New Zealand First members and supporters, um, it seems pretty split with regards to what way they would prefer um, New Zealand First to go. Um, but most most people who would support New Zealand First or who are voting for New Zealand First say we would trust Winston Peters to make the best deal, and um, you know we we trust him to get the most uh, uh, the most leverage that he could possibly use, and and I think that most New Zealand First voters are would not be too upset either way as long as as they feel like they're getting something out of it. Yeah, because it's certainly uh, I mean uh, although it's like a lot of you know. Uh, what would you call New Zealand First, you know, conservative, you know, right wing? I mean, you just describe them as centrist. Yeah. I mean, how's the best classification so, of them? So what's special? What, yeah, so what's special about um, New Zealand First is that they um, veto or they vote against all um, social policy bills. So any bill with with that could be considered social policy basically um, gets a no vote from New Zealand First because they believe that that should be decided by a referendum instead. So um, they will vote against, um, so, so they're considered in the sense conservative, even though maybe most of their MPs are not even conservative, simply because they will um, they will vote no on any um, progressive, you know, socially liberal um, policy um, because they want to do a referendum. Um, and so conservatives or more conservative people might feel safe, completely safe voting for New Zealand first because they know that you know, a vote for New Zealand first. Um, any New Zealand first MP um, is going to vote for no again uh, 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 when it comes to the euthanasia bill. So that's at least the big uh, uh, social issue um, that's going to come up after the elections, either later this year or early next year. There will be a vote on euthanasia, and um, and people know that they can get a guaranteed no vote out of New Zealand first. Whereas uh, national, it, you know, it it might be. Uh, 50-50 at best, and probably more like 60 or 70 percent for it. So, um, and labor, labor, you've interesting. You know, you've got a similar kind of position there. You've got a lot of. Um, they actually do have a lot of um, Pacific uh, Pacific Island uh, backing. A lot of Christian uh, communities in South Auckland, and so you do actually have a number of um, of you know conservative labor uh, MPs as well. So, um, but the only only one that you're going to get a guaranteed. Uh, socially conservative uh, vote from, even if the MPs themselves are not socially conservative, is going to be New Zealand first. I know that, um, and this is when he appeared on Australian television, Winston Peters, like he was compared to Pauline Hanson's One Nation, which he didn't really like the comparison, like he seemed to imply that, uh, you know, oh, I consider Pauline Hanson, you know, One Nation an amateur operation. I've been in, you know, politics uh, 30 years. But the, the way you describe it, because... Um, uh, Pauline Hanson, she does get, you know, uh, uh, blue collar Labor voters as well as uh, conservatives. So when it comes to these, you know, populist parties, they are made up of, you know, both sides. 
yeah, populism seems to be basically kind of an maybe more economically left-wing kind of approach, but with a more socially conservative uh, uh, bent to it. So um, you get a lot of working class, uh, sort of more conservative working class people um, who, who think, oh, well, um, you know, finally, sort of finally a, a party that fits me. And then, you know, the more uh, uh, right-wing um, conservative people are like, oh, well, I'm, I'll, I'll give up on some of this economics if we can at least get, you know, I, I, you know, I, if we can at least get some social, socially conservative issues. Whereas they might say, okay, you know, I've, I've spent spent all these this time, you know, voting for the right wing economics and and all of this, you know, and we've lost, you know, we keep losing over and over again on the social issues. Maybe it's time to start losing on the economics and start winning on the social issues. So that that uh, seems to be the kind of that, that's why they seem to pull from that kind of a base. Yeah. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of speculation about which way Winston will go. There was lots. There were there was this recently this leak about uh, him being overpaid his superannuation, uh, and he really hit out a you know the said it was a conspiracy by you know the National Party. Is is that like is that just political hot air or like is that genuine bad blood it, there? Um, it could be. It could be. Um, I think he's called for two resignations um, uh, in, in the National Party, um, so it could be could be some serious bad blood there, or it could be um, could be politics as usual, really. Um, um, as you have you said before, uh, New Zealand first um, lost uh, representation; they were out of Parliament in two thousand and eight. This was because there was a, a scandal overhanging uh, them with regards to a sort of an uh, electoral fraud, uh, sort of donations. Uh, that had been made that were mis, uh, misfiled or or not um, not attributed properly, um, and so there was you know no wrongdoing was found, but you know the the um, the the air of scandal was enough to to put people off, and and so it seems seems to be handled a lot more cleanly this time, where he's really gone off on the attack, and interestingly enough, the media has um, has sort of come to his defence, saying, hey, actually you know there's not really anything here. Um, but you know the um, um, the books are still open on it, and we don't really have much information. So this there's still three weeks to go, and um, um, as people keep saying, we've had a resignation every week for the past two months or so. So there's uh, you know maybe two or three more resignations to go. So uh, you never know. So I've talked about the the majors and the uh, what you call the major minors, but what about the the other minor parties? Obviously, there's ACT, which is the uh, Libertarian uh, Party. There's also the the Maori Party. Uh, there's also this new. Uh, we've mentioned it a couple of times. New, uh, this other new party, the the Opportunities Party. Obviously, uh, United Future. I mean, United Future, uh, which is. Uh, if you'll pardon the pun there, their future looks in doubt. Um, and uh, obviously <laughs> there's the party that um, you are the head of, the Make New Zealand Great Again party. So can you give us a, a rundown on what their uh, chances are? Yeah, um, so um, if we're looking at minor parties, you either, you've got two options. You win an electorate or you get to 5%. And those are your two ways of getting into Parliament. Um, when it comes to any minor party getting 5% at the moment, um, it's um, the chances of that seem to be zero, absolutely zero. So um, your, one, your one option that these minor parties have got at the moment is to win an electorate. Um, and the ACT Party has got one um, basically guaranteed, uh, the seat of Epsom in Auckland, which is where um, all the rich people live. So the... Um, and... Uh, at least that's the joke, sort of. Not all the rich people live there, um, and it, it it would be a very safe national seat. But national have basically given it given it over to to act. Um, uh, a previous act leader did win it um, all on his own, trying really hard, and and act sort of held it since then. And, and when national lost it once, they sort of said, "Ah, oh, well, we'll you know you can keep it for the un, until we decide you can't anymore." Um, and so, so ACT will get that it, one if they like, can get is over. It a stitch up between, like, would you describe it as a stitch up between ACT and National, or like from what you're saying, like yeah, ACT that based... one at fair and square. Yeah. So, so one of so a previous leader uh, Rodney Hyde won at fair and square, and he would have held at fair and square no problem. Um, the next uh, uh, 
after he was pushed aside, um, uh, a former Auckland mayor, John Banks, um, got it. And he was a former National Party member, and uh, I think there was a, a cup of tea um, scandal, you could call it that. Um, people people joke about having a cup of tea, and, and that's what that having a special uh, special deal known as, uh, is known as, as as having a cup of tea in New Zealand now. So basically, uh, John Key and John Banks had a had a cup of tea in a in a uh, um, cafe somewhere, and you know John Key sort of said, you know, yeah, we'll let you we'll let you win the sea. We won't really contest it. And somebody uh, taped it and leaked it out. And um, anyway, John Banks won the seat because that's that's the way they did it. And it was called a dirty deal at the time. But they, um, you know, they're not completely uncommon. Um, the uh, other party, minor party that we mentioned, United Future, um, they've basically held a seat uh, with uh, Peter Dunn. He won it fair and square initially as well. And since then, uh, Nationals basically said, uh, you know, you can keep it, and you, you know, you can work with it. as long as he's working with us, so he can keep it, and that's. You know, the last nine years he'd been doing that, um, but he was going to lose to Labour this time and decided to resign instead. So he's gone, and I think United Future is gone with him. They're not going to get five percent. They're not going to win anything. So that's that's really the end of, of United Future um, because they can't win an electorate and they can't get five percent. Um, and um, yeah, coming back to the uh, to the ACT Party um, uh, when the new leader David Seymour took over uh, last time, National basically gave it to him. But I think this time, if they were to try and really take him on, um, it's likely he might actually um, he might actually really win it if they were to try and take it off him. So um, uh, once you got a seat, it's hard to it's a bit harder to lose it. You know, the incumbent uh, has has that advantage. Um, but there is really definitely uh, deals that go on there. Um, they're not people people don't seem to mind. I think the electorates like to feel important um, when you can, especially in an MMP system where there's a mixed um, you know, a mix between electorates and just straight up party votes. So um, um, the people of uh, um, Epsom seem to like having, you know, their special guy uh, of his own party in parliament. Um, and yeah, those are really the only two normal electorates that go that way. And of course, we also have Maori electorates, the special seats uh, that only Maori can vote in and win. We have seven of those. Uh, most of them are held by Labour, but a couple of them are um, probably one or I think two of them were probably be picked up by the Maori Party, and possibly one of them by uh, the Mana Party, um, which is another basically uh, uh, similar, more left-wing version of the Maori Party, um, and they sometimes have deals going on there. But um, generally, Labour tries to win them all. Um, National doesn't bother; nobody else bothers as well. So basically, it's either Labour or some um, special. Uh, um, uh, dare I say, racist uh, party that wins it, um, race-based party anyway, that uh, wins those seats. Um, and when it comes to any other um, parties, we've got, uh, we do actually have a conservative party ourselves. Um, they won't win an electorate. Um, they're polling at, you know, 0.5%. Maybe they'll get 1% or 2% on the day. Um, they just get no press, no media. They've got no, no real coverage with their current leader. Um, their old leader was um, a disgraced, now disgraced leader. Um, could get them coverage, uh, could get in the media, and could how get some. Uh, um, how would I describe him as? Um, oh, how is weird, he uh, creepy. A oh, disgrace. Sorry, oh, he was disgraced. Yeah, so by being creepy, um, um, his his press secretary resigned. Uh, I think the day before the election, um, and she accused him of um, 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 sexually harassing her, basically. Yeah, yeah, um, that, that's... Or at least, at least. That's the worst type of coverage um, you can get as a leader of a conservative yeah, party. Yeah, um, it wasn't it wasn't physical, but it was he wrote her weird notes and and sent her poems and all kinds of strange things. So it wasn't any any um, touching. Super super dodgy. It was no, there was no touching involved, but some very yeah. Basically, he's a very strange person. Um, but he bankrolled the entire party by himself, and and he managed to get up to four four percent. Um. But they they're basically gone now because you know after something like that happens, people need need some time to uh, rethink <laughs> rethink their support for uh, for for an organisation that ends up that bad. Um, and we've got a couple of other um, smaller parties. Um, you mentioned um, uh, Make New Zealand Great Again. Uh, we've got got um, you got to get um, a good number of members to get uh, get registered, and you got to get out there and um, try and hit that five percent. Um, and we really have nobody. Uh, um, uh, don't 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 really have the people for 
to get to that kind of goal. And I think there are a bunch of other minor parties that I won't, won't name who are basically in a similar position. Some of them are registered, some of them are not. Some of them will contest electorates, um, some of them won't. Um, and um, the final one that I'll mention and that we've talked about before is Gareth Morgan's top party, the Opportunities Party. Um, it's a sort of a cult of personality as well. It's why they're in the media. It's why they're polling somewhere. Um, and I think it's why they can get somewhere, top can get somewhere, act can get somewhere, because they both have these these leaders that are out there. Um, and these other parties, uh, Conservatives now, United Future now, they've got nobody. They don't have they don't have someone who's got that that cult of personality following, really, that you sort of need in politics, apparently. Um, and and they're just not going to get you just get no votes. Um, and and even with that sort of cult of personality, people have really struggled to get above five percent. Um, New Zealand First is the only party that's really done it. Um, and I I would say on the day, Opportunities Party is looking at one or two percent as well of the vote tops. Good pun. Is Gareth Morgan is he quite wealthy as well? Yes, yeah, so he's another wealthy person bankrolling his own party. Um, he's very left wing but with a little bit of right wing sprinkled in there. Um, and he's very, he's very, um, as we've mentioned before, with his lipstick on a pig comment. And that's, that's his, his style is very, um, and he's big on, he's big on the, on the personal insults actually. Um, and big on, 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 um, on saying things that are not politically correct. That's why I'm, maybe I say he's got a little bit of right wing sprinkled in there because, um, Definitely, P politically correct is not a, is not the way to describe him, um, and and really he's yeah he's got so much money he's 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 decided uh, why not run for uh, politics and that seems to be what people do in New Zealand I don't know about yeah. uh, Australia, but uh, when people have too much money in New Zealand they decide to go into politics. Because uh, didn't you have was it last election another billionaire was it Kim dot com am I, I recalling? Kim, yeah, Kim at Kim dot com. Yeah, yeah, same thing. So Kim.com, um, yeah, not even a New Zealand, I don't think he was actually running because he's not a New Zealand citizen. Um, he might be a New Zealand citizen, I'm not actually sure. Um, but he, I, I don't think he ran, ran himself, but he bankrolled the party and he campaigned for them. Um, and yeah, just, just um, these people blow millions of dollars on these campaigns um, and they don't get anywhere. Um, yeah, so, so that's a, a strange quirk of New Zealand politics, really. You know, um, in, in at least in America, as far as I can tell, if you've got millions of dollars to spend on politics, you can get something for it. But in New Zealand, apparently, um, apparently, it doesn't work so well. Well, in exactly three weeks' time, we'll we'll know the result, and um, yeah, I'll be over there covering uh, election night. So it's certainly going to be uh, a very interesting result. So thank you once again for coming on, Duo. Oh, looking forward to seeing you uh, in the flesh, and uh, I hope you enjoy our election and enjoy the beautiful uh, uh, scenery and hopefully weather that we have in New Zealand. And uh, thanks again for having me on the show. Uh, I'm a political junkie, so any elections are always exciting for me. I am looking forward to yeah meeting you and and the rest of the the Right Minds crew in in just a week's time now. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Uh, just a reminder about another upcoming event for The Unshackled is that we are sponsoring the first ever uh, Liberty Fest event in Brisbane on Saturday, 14th of October, 2017. It's hosted by our friends at Liberty Works. Now, supporters of The Unshackled can get a 20% discount on tickets by visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LF, UNSHACK, all caps. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.